On the next Prairie Sportsman, we go fishing on the St. Croix River with a seasoned angler and the fishing guide he mentored. And we learn about battling invasive carp on the Mississippi and St. Croix rivers. And we'll join Nicole Zempel for a fast forage. Welcome to Prairie Sportsman, I'm Brett Amundsen. We got a great show for you this week and it starts right now. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. Mark and Margaret yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Live wide open. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters and the members of Pioneer PBS. The St. Croix River that forms the Minnesota-Wisconsin border from Hinckley to Prescott has been federally protected since it was designated a wild and scenic river in 1968. Much of the upper St. Croix has been free from the pollution pressures of agriculture and urban development, and it's known as one of the country's cleanest rivers. In October, we joined three guys who have spent thousands of hours Fishing the Croix. I used to fish a lot of lakes, and I got to admit, I just keep coming back to the river because I know it, and there's no houses, and I catch a lot of fish. <laughs> so I had to stick to the river. Put in at Wim O'Brien, and a lovely park. It gets busy in the springtime, but this time of year, just the locals are out there, and maybe a few duck hunters. Very few people. Unspoiled shoreline, you can't beat it. Rice Lake area of the St. Croix. It's an amazing fishery, and it's just, it's scenic, it's beautiful. Um, fishing the river is not like fishing lakes, and it's something more exciting about the river. It's always moving. Ryan, who uh, started a guide business, I met him through my buddy Kevin. They live next, near each other, and Ryan details boats and likes fishing, so we started fishing and uh, got him hooked up here too, and uh, been showing him some spots and how to read the current and stuff, and he's a good learner, and now he has his own guide business. So I just started guiding uh, as of this year, named Croy Boys Guided Adventures kind of after these guys, uh, the Croy boys, I call them. Eric's a hell of a guide. <laughs> He's taught me pretty much everything about this river. <laughs> I guess I introduced you. Ooh, I missed this one. I introduced you to swim baits, I guess, huh? That's about all you learned from me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. That's a good one. We're band damming him. Oh, that's a walleye. A little floater here. You'll get, I'll let you get some. It's a keeper. Are we keeping fish today? We, we don't nah. So this is about average up here. It's all about your eyes. You don't need a fish finder. Not up here. It doesn't help me any. I met you, sir. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Get him out of the motor. Oh, Jesus. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you see that mouth come at you? <laughs> he was trying to swim out of it. There we go. Take him out. That is a dandy. Yee! Ah! There you go, Kev! Yeah. 
grew up on a little river down in Rochester, but limited to fishing, of course, you know, very limited. Yeah, I mean, it's a river so small you couldn't put a boat on it. Maybe a canoe if you were lucky if a flood came through. And, uh, and then finally graduated to, you know, having a boat and fishing bigger water and loving every minute. My wife Eileen and I came out here on our honeymoon back in 89 and camped with my brother in St. Croix. And we loved it so much, we, we got back to Philadelphia, we made a mental note, if we ever moved back to Minnesota, it's gotta be the St. Croix area. And that's exactly what happened. Most memorable thing on the river is uh, probably catching a 45 pound flathead at night. It was really fun, yeah. And one time I saw a paddlefish come out of the water and do a backflip like a dolphin would at SeaWorld. And I didn't believe I saw it. And when I did see it, my wife heard the huge splash, and I'm like, did I just see what I just saw? And it was a paddlefish. The thing must have been five, six feet long. I have, that really floored me when I saw that. I grew up fishing. My dad was a hardcore fisherman. Uh, he was a boiler maker, so we moved all over the state, but I call Thief River Falls kind of my home. Uh, so I grew up fishing uh, Lake of the Woods and Red Lake during the crappie boom and the Red River. And my dad got me hooked on fishing and I've loved it ever since. My first sturgeon I ever caught was at Lake of the Woods. We were jigging for walleyes and I, I snagged a sturgeon right in the fin and we chased that thing around for an hour and we had a hundred walleyes on the clicker already. My dad wanted me just to cut it. I'm like, are you, you gotta be kidding me. I had a six pound test line on and it was stretched, man. And we had to throw it all away. But we got it in the boat after an hour of <laughs> chasing it around. My parents are divorced, so I would go to my mom's in the summertime and I would ride my bike three miles to the Minnesota River and I would bring tin foil and butter and onions and a fillet knife and I would catch channel cats out of the river and I'd fillet them up and cook them on a fire when I was 12, 13 years old. It's, it's just something I enjoy just being in the outdoors and enjoying nature and especially up here without houses and things around and really nobody. Uh, it's nothing better and it's peaceful. I have three kids, have a family, and it's, it's hard to fish and get out fishing very often. So I spent 10 years buffing boats and I thought it was time. It was time to get my captain's license. It was time to make the guiding a reality. And after meeting Eric and Kevin and learning the river, uh, I felt confident that I could get people on fish. So I did it. You gotta go through your captain's school. You gotta learn the rules of the road, you know, rules of the river, uh, safety, um, navigational buoys is a huge one. Then you gotta do first aid, you gotta do CPR, you gotta get your TWIT card, you gotta do a drug test, and then you send all your paperwork into the Coast Guard. You gotta get sworn into the Coast Guard. Not all about the electronics finding fish, it's honestly, it's about river seams, it's about finding these sandbars, uh, depth does not uh, determine fish, right? It's the bait that does it. The bait will be in shallow water and follow these fish up, up river into the shallows and that's why you happen to find walleyes in three feet of water. And it's not normal like lakes where you find them, you know, in that 17 feet range to 20 feet range. You don't know what might happen given day to day and the variety of fish. I mean, what's ever, in the lakes, it's definitely here in the river, plus more, plus more. The muskies, northerns, catfish, sturgeon, white bass, paddlefish, sheephead, crappies, uh, catfish, channels, flatheads, suckers, 
buffalo, carp, go on and on. You got to know, get to know the currents and the, the eddies where the fish will lay. Uh, and also know the birds help too. Where the seagulls are feeding on the shad, you want to fish there if the, the birds are up here. And also visually just look for fish feeding, chasing minnows along the side. And they're usually silver bass or large or smallmouth bass. Today we've been catching all our fish on uh, shad wraps and some top water and uh, minnows do very well this year, but I, I think we're gonna be sticking to what we've been doing, casting shad baits. I got 100 minnows in here and probably used only three of them. <laughs> so lures are working, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs>
4th of July comes, Memorial Day comes, that fish is tucked up tight in Anderson Bay, and as soon as we're back, Monday, Tuesday, that fish is gone. There is, you know, evidence there to suggest that these fish will associate uh, certain activities, like such as netting, uh, with like the sound of, of commercial fishermen pounding on the side of the boat, with the fact that they had surgery last time they were caught. So they kind of, you know, have a tendency to panic in large groups and then therefore escape uh, and try to do everything in their power. Or, I mean, we've even had this fish hide behind trees as we're trying to detect them. Of the three invasive carp that we have in Minnesota, uh, big head carp tend to get the biggest. Um, we don't have a lot of those. Those usually come first on, with the invasion front. And then silver carp come in after that. And silver carp are the ones that jump. Following these fish around, we learn about new habitats that they like to be in. And oftentimes we can sample that area where that fish actually is and potentially remove other species, mainly silver carp. We start by you know, deploying the, the purse seine, and we set that out using two commercial fishing boats. And once that purse seine is completely closed up, then we can start pulling it like a traditional beach seine. Our invasive carp program started in 2012, uh, started with LCCMR funding, and since then we've branched out uh, and really tried to focus on new and innovative techniques. Telemetry involves uh, surgically implanting a hydroacoustic tag that's about the size of your thumb into a fish. We just flip the fish over on a, a surgery cooler that's specially made. You just you know, cut open the fish, you carefully implant this tag, you suture the fish back up, and then you hold it in the water for a little while to make sure that it recovers adequately before you release it. We have a whole network of receivers throughout Minnesota's waters that help us detect these individual tags. The DNR has tagged almost 300 fish on the Minnesota, St. Croix, and Mississippi rivers, including native species like muskie, sturgeon, and bigmouth buffalo. One of the key ones is paddlefish. And we can actually watch paddlefish movement. And oftentimes it's closely associated if there's invasive carp moving upstream. The paddlefish are often moving upstream at the same time or very similar timing. Right now in Minnesota, most of our invasive carp are centraled around anywhere from Pool 8 down in La Crosse, all the way up to about Winona areas. All of those fish have been moving upstream since they were introduced or accidentally introduced in the 1970s down in Arkansas. We had a high water event in 2019, we had a whole bunch of fish move up, and we had this large capture of 50 or so in Pool 8 in La Crosse. The big Seine Hall, they got a whole pile of them here. We've already pulled out five silvers and three grass carp. These fish continually move up with each high water event that we have. That's what they're looking for, for not only food, but also for, for reproduction to spawn. We do not actually have a confirmed uh, sampling report saying that they have spawned in Minnesota. The biggest problem with invasive carp is that where they land in the food chain, they, they eat the bottom, they eat algae, they eat you know, phytoplankton and zooplankton. So they're eating what everything else needs at some point in their life to survive. Everyone always thinks that walleye are one of the top predators. Well, they start out as small fry. They can't eat minnows on day five of their existence. They need that small phytoplankton, zooplankton to survive. Agencies use several different methods to remove carp. Netting is probably the, the best way, and that's what's been proven down south in high density populations, is that commercial fishing tends to be the easiest way to remove these fish. On November 30th, the DNR pulled a record 331 invasive carp from the Mississippi River's Pool 6, including 289 silver carp. The capture was made possible by partnering with Wisconsin DNR staff to track tagged invasive carp. The Minnesota DNR is also working with the U.S. Geological Survey to deploy floating gill nets and an underwater speaker system that can drive silver carp over the nets. We irritate them to the point that they jump, kind of like boat motors downstream. The system was developed in Columbia, Missouri and tested on the Mississippi last October. Six silver and one grass carp were captured and tagged in pools six and eight. We also do use electrofishing. We actually take out a specialized boat that allows us 
to put electricity down into the water from anodes. We can use it to not only sample fish and collect fish, you know, we'll, we'll have two netters on the bow of the boat scooping up fish, um, but we can also use it to drive fish. So we don't have to use high electricity with invasive carp all the time. Boat fishing is one of the, the ways that citizens can partake in the removal of invasive carp. Uh, downstream of here, where there's a high den higher density populations, it's one of the ways that people can go out and actually make a sport of it to get these things out of our system. We don't see a lot of pressure up here for that quite yet, mostly because we don't have a high enough po density population. We had a, a work plan that was originally established in, I think it was 2011, to pretty much get all of our options for what to do on the table, and then we'll start analyzing that so that we find the best options for Minnesota. So all of our partnering agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, USGS, even Wisconsin DNR and Iowa DNR, they're all working on the same network. We'll start comparing all of the different methods, combination of methods, figure out how, which one's most cost effective, and then we'll actually write our action plan for Minnesota. If we don't do anything about invasive carp, uh, you know, a, a leisurely cruise on the St. Croix, you might have to, you know, if you go out there, you might have to put shields up, like acrylic shields on the front of your boat. Um, you know, there's a lot of boats downstream that have chain link fence around their council so that the driver of the boat doesn't get knocked out of the boat as they're driving downstream. I mean, the, these fish will break bones, they'll give you concussions, um, they'll do damage to your boat. There's always going to be the opinion that, you know, the whole thing is a lost cause. You know, they're already here, they're, they're gonna be established in the next who knows how many years. Who cares, right? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm doing this for my children's children's children. I'm doing it for yours. Why give up on something so great that we have here in Minnesota? Okay, well then, I am standing among some beautiful nanny berry bushes. They are a little bit stressed just because we've had, you know, drought now for the past few summers, but they are still producing berries and you can see they're starting to turn. They're really pretty fall colors. They kind of remind me of sumac because you get the real vibrant yellows, oranges and reds and the nanny berry shrub tree produces those same really vibrant colors. So the fun thing about the nanny berry is that it is completely, in my opinion, unique. Texturally, it's unique. It's got a thicker inside, almost kind of like a banana. And then I also feel that it tastes a bit like a banana, or I've heard people describe it as figgy or kind of prune-like. To ID this, um, nanny berries typically, well, it's a native shrub or tree, um, to the east and then going into the upper Midwest area. So it is native to Minnesota. Let's see, the leaves, they grow what we would call opposite. And so they are straight across from each other. And if you can see, they kind of create like a bit of a V, a V shape. So they are just opposite of one another. And then I am not sure what this little pokey bit is called, but the nanny berry bush also has that on at the end of each of their um, branches. And so in the, in the spring, um, May to June, you're gonna see these bushes with really pretty kind of creamy white uh, flowers that have five petals uh, per flower. And then those uh, give way to then these clusters of berries. And so they start out um, in the summer, late June, July, August, they're kind of green initially. They turn into kind of a, a red, a deep red, or I guess maybe deep kind of candy apple red like that. And then eventually when they're all the way ripe, which is usually um, fall, depending on, you know, weather, but September, October, it's a great time to harvest nanny berries and they, 
will sometimes shrivel up and kind of look a little bit like a raisin. But when they are black like this, they are ready to harvest and they are delicious. Now, also another reminder, I'm standing here and yes, these are nanny berries. They are edible and they're very, very good for me. But behind me, there is a snowberry plant and there is also buckthorn and those berries um, are black as well. And so just know your plants and know your surroundings. And when you are harvesting, in this case, the nanny berry, just make sure that every berry that you pick is coming from a plant that you know is the nanny berry bush or tree. So know your surroundings. When um, prepping these yummy, delicious berries, because texturally they are thicker, kind of a a thicker inside, I guess. Um, I like to put them in just a slow cooker with a little bit of water and then kind of let them come up to a boil or a simmer for probably a good hour. Then after that, I'm gonna old school mash them up with like the pedestal and then kind of a conical strainer kind of thing. I don't know what they're called, but they work great and it allows me to separate the skin and seed from the innards of the berry. Um, and then you can transform that into like a berry butter. You can make like a mousse. You can make, I make nanny berry maple syrup. That's fantastic. The filling or what you're creating, um, almost like a paste, a nanny berry paste, it's good on all sorts of baked items. So just kind of a treat and um, something fun to harvest in the fall. And in the winter, something for the deer and wildlife to still munch on and enjoy. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. Mark and Margaret yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Live wide open. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters and the members of Pioneer PBS.